thank you so much for having me. Um, so I want to talk to you today about the 2016 elections. I was asked to talk about the 2016 elections, Trump, Sanders, and political transformation. But in a way, the title is somewhat misleading uh, because I don't actually really want to talk about Trump and Sanders very much. Instead, I want to talk about the political processes that have um, got us to where we are today. Uh, so just to draw out the metaphor a little bit, this is a Rube Goldberg device. You may have seen it before. It's a mouse trap. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, the mouse goes in at the beginning, and he wants to get the cheese, and he goes through various obstacles and sort of you know challenges and overcomes them, and th some things help him along, and he ends up in a little basket uh, and gets shot into space. Right. So this is Rube Goldberg's. Uh, mouse trap, and I think it's a good metaphor uh, for elections because we have a certain number of mice that go in at the beginning, and the the challenges and obstacles are actually there no matter what mouse you're talking about. So um, if Sanders and Trump are my mice, I want to talk more about the trap uh, around them. Okay, so um, so we're going to talk more about processes than personalities. Uh, and in terms of the left, these are the political changes that I want to focus on. I want to talk a little bit about the pro-government American. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of overlapping inequalities in the United States. And I'm going to talk about the possibilities for movement consolidation on the left. And then on the right, I want to talk a little bit about the motivations of the conservative base and how that plays into Donald Trump's support. I want to talk about the role of the media in contemporary politics and in particular the role of the media in conservative politics. Um, and I'm going to talk about the rise of political entrepreneurs. And we're actually going to start on the right. Uh, and so this, is, uh, this section is going to draw a little bit on my previous work on the Tea Party, uh, because in many ways I think that there's uh, strong connections between what you're seeing with Donald Trump and what we saw uh, with the Tea Party in the first years of the Obama administration. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about grassroots conservatives, I'm going to talk about the right-wing media, and I'm going to talk about political entrepreneurs. And we're going to start with the grassroots conservatives. Um, First of all, I want to make it clear that the Tea Party and Trump supporters are not demographically exactly the same people. I mean, obviously there are some people who were in both camps, but they're not precisely the same. Uh, they have some things in common. One reason you might think that Trump supporters are Tea Party supporters is because Trump supporters are in general older, they are whiter, and they're more male than sort of uh, the broader population. But Trump supporters are, um, are also less educated and less wealthy than the public at large. And the Tea Party, by contrast, was more educated and more wealthy than the public at large. And Trump supporters are much less closely tied to the Republican Party than Tea Party supporters. And this, I think, is the most important thing to think about in terms of the demographics. Tea Party supporters were politically engaged before being involved in the Tea Party. Now, they may not have been involved in electoral politics, although many of the activists I spoke to had been. But they were often, they were civically engaged. And remember, these are um, older conservative people, these are often retirees, these are people you imagine sort of attending uh, local meetings, these are people who had been on the library board, who had been to school board meetings when their kids were young. So these are civically engaged people who are closely tied to the Republican Party and much more likely to engage in all kinds of civic activism, political activism, including being more likely to vote. By contrast, Trump supporters are less closely tied to the Republican Party and considerably less likely to vote on average uh, than the public at large and than other Republicans. All right. So they're quite different on demographic grounds once you're looking within uh, older white conservatives. Uh, but in terms of beliefs, even though they're not precisely the same people, the Tr Trump supporters and the Tea Party are really very similar indeed. And I just want to talk about a few of the ways in which their beliefs are similar. First and probably foremost is that Trump supporters are very strongly motivated by anti-immigrant sentiment. This is one of the aspects of Trump supporters that makes them different from supporters of other Republican candidates like Ted Cruz. Uh, Trump supporters are much more strongly motivated by immigration questions and by, in general, questions about uh, dangers external to the United States. Um, similarly, Tea Party supporters were extremely highly motivated by anti-immigrant sentiment. And this is something that uh, didn't get a lot of attention at the beginning of the Tea Party. There was a lot of focus on sort of taxes and budgets. And it's not that those things weren't concerns that people were raising. I mean, some said, people said that tea stood for taxed enough already. And I'll talk a little bit about what that meant. But when I pr uh, surveyed Tea Party activists in the Massachusetts area, which is not the highest immigration state in the country by far, 
uh, the second most important issue for them after taxes in the budget was immigration. And this is 2000, early 2010. So we're talking about quite a long time before the most recent round of immigration debates in this country. Immigration was already a primary interest for many people in the Tea Party. And that, uh, that sort of fits in with some of the other themes we'll talk about. Trump act, uh, supporters are also uh, very protective of government programs for people they see as deserving, right? You, uh, you probably remember Trump saying far less harsh things about Social Security and Medicare than you've heard from other Republican candidates, than you hear from someone like Paul Ryan. He talks about protecting those programs. Uh, and Tea Party activists are also strongly supportive of Social Security and Medicare. Many of them are, of course, Social Security and Medicare recipients. But it's part of a larger ideological commitment on their part to government programs that go to people they see as deserving. Now, of course, the question is who is deserving? And there's been great work uh, done by people other than me, but excellent uh, work looking specifically at what um, people in the Tea Party meant by that. And lar I mean, it is largely substantively motivated by sort of a racial resentment idea um, so that younger people, minorities, are sort of assumed to not have worked hard enough to be relying on the state uh, because of a lack of personal initiative as opposed to um, fine upstanding Americans like themselves who did their part and now deserve the benefits that they earned. So, but the important thing to think about here is that protecting major government investments like Social Security and Medicare uh, is at the base, right, the base of the, of the Tea Party is at odds with much of the rhetoric you hear from the elite part of the Tea Party, sort of the aspects of the Tea Party that were funded by like, groups like the Koch brothers, Americans for Prosperity, that kind of thing. They really commit themselves to a very extreme free market ideology, which is not the attitude of rank and file Tea Party supporters. Rank and file Tea Party supporters are in fact de defend, at least for themselves and people they see as deserving, major government investments in the social safety net. Now that anti-immigrant sentiment and the sort of racial resentment that underlies a lot of these attitudes uh, comes together with a sort of broader uh, feeling of nostalgia uh, in, in Tea Party activists and also in Donald Trump supporters, sort of a fear of cultural change. This is not the country I grew up in. And Barack Obama was very much seen as a symbol of that new America that changed America, right? And I think that was actually something that was true on the right and the left, that Barack Obama was a symbol of change. And for some people that was hope. And for other people it was quite frightening. Uh, so there's this nostalgia that younger America is a more diverse America, it's a different America, and it's not my America, was a sentiment I heard over and over again when I spoke to people in the Tea Party. Last two pieces I think you also hear resonance of with Trump. Um, first of all, a significant skepticism about science and expertise. And I think, I mean, with Trump, you know, again and again you see um, people in the media and sort of maybe even Republican leaders, they're sort of trying to fact check Donald Trump. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have any impact. It's like facts bounce right off, you know, and where, why is this not mattering for his support? Well, the Republican Party has committed itself in a significant way to undermining science, uh, undermining the idea of science, undermining scientific consensus like global warming. Uh, and and I, I heard a lot of that concern of the you know, sort of elites in fancy universities on the coasts, not to name names, uh, looking down on middle America. Right? And there was just a, there was in general a sense of doubt about what scientists say, what experts tell me are facts. And this is something that travels right through the Trump movement. Finally, uh, though Tea Party activists were not uh, free market ideologues by any stretch of the imagination, there was uh, a real conviction that wealthy people had earned their money. Right, that wealthy people were successful people, hard-working people, represent the best of America. There are, you know, many people in the Tea Party either owned or had owned small businesses. And so they see themselves sort of of a type with far larger business owners. Uh, and so I think that that also plays out in the Trump phenomenon that you see, I mean, Donald Trump has been selling kind of a language of success, uh, you know, sort of buy into my um, sort of brand, which is fundamentally about business success. And I think that that's one of the other ways in which these movements are very similar. All right, so demographically, kind of the same, but not completely the same. Ideologically uh, striking similarities uh, when it comes to grassroots conservatives in the Trump phenomenon and in the Tea Party. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about right-wing media. Um, and just a reminder, in case you don't recall the origins of the Tea Party, in February 2009, so we are talking about the very first weeks of the Obama administration, this is a man named Rick Santelli. He was a, he was a host for CNBC. This is him broadcasting from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. He was supposed to give a relatively normal broadcast, you know, updating on 
the Mercantile Exchange. Instead, he goes on a rant about Barack Obama's housing policies, which had just been released. And the languages sound very familiar now. It's all sort of language of makers and takers, and that this policy that Barack Obama is putting forward will take your money and give it to people who are undeserving, who um, made bad choices, who made stupid choices about you know, building extra bathrooms on their home, is what he says. Uh, and that this is fundamentally not only a bad idea, but an un-American idea, that the founding fathers would be rolling over in their graves. And he calls for a Chicago Tea Party. Right? And now there had always already been anti-Obama protests, uh, but they hadn't got a single set of symbols to rally around, and they hadn't also gotten very much attention. But this language gets picked up within hours by conservative radio hosts across the country, and you hear these clips of him on the TV over and over again. And then, so it starts with conservative radio, it moves quickly to Fox News. This is a screenshot from Fox News in the weeks leading up to the April 15th, 2009, Tea parties, and as you can see, or maybe you can't quite, that's Glenn Beck and that's Sean Hannity. Um, and so they sent their hosts to cities around the country and promoted those uh, to where the tea parties were going to be. And they, in fact, acted sort of as MCs or, or sort of um, special guests at the tea party events of April 15th, which of course drew huge crowds in part as a result, uh, largely as a result of the sort of round the clock coverage that Fox News gave them. And I can show you that, I mean, the extent to which Fox News made itself a part of the Tea Party is obvious even in the headline here. You see FNC, Fox News Channel, Tax Day Tea Parties, right? So Fox News attached their brand, which is worth a lot with older white conservatives, um, attached their brand to the Tea Parties very early on. And um, the results are pretty clear mathematically. So this is a chart of Tea Party coverage. It's simply the frequency of how often anyone said the phrase Tea Party in the spring, in that same spring. The peak here is those April 15th rallies, and the dark bars are CNN, the lighter bars are Fox News. And as you can see, CNN, at the moment of the actual rallies, talked about the Tea Party even more than Fox News. But what Fox News does that's interesting is slowly ramps up coverage for, up for several weeks, in fact, months in advance, and then the coverage tails off very slowly too, right? So what you see with Fox News is them not just playing the role of, of covering an event, right, which is what CNN does, but as a, they play a, what we call in our book a sort of social movement organizer role, right, that they are creating a set of, sh a sort of shared language for um, Fox News viewers to understand that the Tea Party is for them, right? And you've got to remember, uh, older conservatives are, do not normally come out of a protest tradition, right, so you're asking people to engage in a kind of political activity that's unusual for them. Uh, that sort of contestatory in the street politics is not necessarily what, what um, people who are in the Tea Party were comfortable with. Many told me they'd never been to a rally before the Tea Parties. But with the language of Fox News sort of telling you that you should go, in fact, literally telling you that you should go, and then getting to see your favorite hosts live in person in your town, you know, these were things that really helped increase turnout. Now, how does that relate to Donald Trump, right? So Donald Trump... Um, did not come, he is not a conservative radio host, for instance, though he is beloved by many of them. Um, but Donald Trump recognized what had happened to the media landscape, right? Because what you see is ideas develop in the right wing media sort of echo chamber, as some other scholars have called it, and then filter out into the mainstream media. You see that CNN covers the Tea Parties more than Fox does, right? When they actually happen. So those ideas filter out of the conservative media, and the mainstream media will pick them up. And the mainstream media has a very hard time if something seems you know, brightly colored and controversial like the Tea Party did. You'll remember that these are people dressing up in revolutionary garb and standing in the street shout. I mean, it's, it's very eye-catching, right? So the mainstream media has a very hard time putting down something that's eye-catching. And Donald Trump, I mean, fundamentally <laughs> is extremely eye-catching in any of a number of ways. Uh, but also, I mean, he's a product of the media. This is what he does, right? He was a brand. Like he was a, uh, you know, he put his name on things and sold them, and a tremendously wide array of things, right? And he had his own sort of base that he could come from, right? He knew how to work. I mean, he sort of out Fox News Fox, right? So I think that it's not that they're the same phenomenon, but they're operating in the same environment. They're operating in the same media environment. What Trump managed to do was take advantage of what had become of the media system, right? And some of the, um, the ways in which the media system is skewed or biased or um, has sort of struggled in some ways, I think Trump managed to sort of step into that void. All right. And that leads really clearly to the last thing I want to talk about, which is political entrepreneurs. Um, so this is, uh, this is David Koch here, and he is talking at an Americans for Prosperity event. He is obviously one of the Koch brothers, one of the uh, wealthiest people in the world. 
And Americans for Prosperity is one of the conservative organizations he helps run. I'll talk about more of them. Um, but David Koch and, to a, I think, a, a really a lesser extent, Donald Trump are both political entrepreneurs. And they've both recognized a moment of, in some sense, malfunction in the Republican Party and stepped into that breach. And they've stepped into it differently. But I think it's a similar phenomenon. So let's talk a little bit about the breach. Um, in many way, there are many ways of thinking about the sort of decline of, of mainstream Republican institutions. Um, I mean, you can look at the complete collapse of moderate Republicans in Congress. I picked this just because it's a really neat graph. This is George W. Bush's approval ratings over the course of his tenure. He leaves office with some of the lowest approval ratings in, uh, in the time in which we have approval ratings for presidents. Um, and it's not just that George W. Bush was personally unpopular, but he sort of left the Republican Party in a moment of crisis. Um, because the, the sort of uh, institutions associated with him, sort of Karl Rove's institutions among others, weren't, didn't seem like they were getting the job done in terms of being able to um, convince voters that the Republican Party was for them, right? And the Republican Party has been struggling with various demographic challenges for a while, but it wasn't obvious that they were managing to step outside their base. Uh, so there are various ways in which, oh, and I mean, you might think about the fact that, for instance, uh, the RNC at the time was in a state of complete, or the Republican National Committee was in a state of complete crisis, huge fundraising problems during the same period. Um, so who steps in? Well, one, one group of people who step in, or two brothers who step in, are the Koch brothers. This is a very simple analysis of the major organizations that the Koch brothers fund that are sort of part of what you could, should really think of as a shadow party. And the, at the bottom is simply a timeline going back to 1975. So as you can see, the Koch brothers have been tremendously successful um, in uh, and for a long time participated in, in production of conservative and libertarian ideas. Here we have the Cato Institute and so forth. But then there are all these new organizations that spring up here at the end, uh, particularly during the Obama administration, that do things like policy advocacy, uh, that do things like organize other donors to participate in their, um, in their projects, and then also constituency mobilization, the most successful of which is by far Americans for Prosperity, which has chapters all over the country and is very involved in state politics in particular and getting uh, state legislation passed. And then finally, they even have sort of what we call utilities. This is from a paper uh, that Theta Scotchpole and I are working on part of a larger project. Um, utilities, which are doing things like uh, turning out voters, uh, maintaining uh, voter files, all the sorts of things that you think of a party as doing. So what you have here is sort of a shadow party that's been built outside or partly within the sort of crumbling infrastructure of the Republican Party. And I'm not joking when I say it's a shadow party. It's actually larger than the RNC by, any, by several measures. Uh, they have 1,200 year-round full-time staff, which is three times the RNC staffing. They're expected to say, spend $889 million this year, which is twice what the RNC spent in 2012. So uh, the, the Koch brothers have sort of stepped into the breach as other Republican organizations have declined. And uh, I think you can think of Trump as having done, in many ways, the same thing. Now, the Kochs are limited to an important extent by the fact that they are ideologically committed to a very extreme version of free market uh, politics, right? Uh, they come out of a libertarian background themselves personally, uh, but they, and of course that is also in line with their interests as, as very wealthy people and very wealthy businessmen, so it is both ideology and interest. Um, but they're limited by that, by that ideology to some extent, because as we spoke about earlier, the conservative base is actually not a bunch of free market uh, ideologues, right? So they're challenged in some way by those limits. Donald Trump faces no such challenges, to the best of my knowledge. He does not have an ideology uh, that is uh, coherent, limiting in any meaningful way. So what he did was take all the positions that are most popular with the Republican base. Right? He was willing to say things about immigration. He was willing to say things about minorities that had previously been unacceptable to say explicitly, if maybe imply, but never say. Right? He was willing to say them. Uh, he, and, but at the same time, he was perfectly willing to say that free trade might be bad and that social security is good. And uh, he was just willing to take the full range of positions that are popular and hold them all. Because uh, to the extent that I think there's a coherent uh, ideology behind Donald Trump, it is one of self-aggrandizement. Right? So there was no reason for him not to take all the best positions, which is one reason I think you can see him doing so well in this presidential primary. Um, now, the last thing I'll say about this before we move on is just that the fact that the Koch brothers did not get to pick their presidential candidate should not be understood as a limit on their success in any meaningful way. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the ways they, that the states are in Republican hands later. But you've got to remember, a lot of what uh, free market ideologues would like to do is um, uh, stop government from doing things. 
And in the American system, you can stop government from doing things without holding the presidency. You just need one branch of Congress, right? So if you can impose austerity via gridlock, I mean, I'm sure there's, there are, of course, values to having the presidency as well, but the, values are not, the value of the presidency is not as large for the conservative movement right now as it would be for the left. Because what the left would like to do, as we'll talk about, is big government interventions. Well, you need the presidency for that, right? Um, but that's not actually a requirement to do most of what the Koch brothers would like. A lot of that can be done from the minority. All right. So that's the right.